All right. Welcome, everybody. It's November 23rd. This is week eight since EOS independence. Um, last week, we had a pretty productive discussion talking about uh, net plugin improvements, um, P2P improvements more, more broadly. Um, the outcome of that, I'm not sure if, if Stephen, there's been, I've linked to the, I know we had this um, GitHub issue here, tracking that. Um, and I know you were taking some notes during during the call yesterday. Have, have, are those already now captured here, or is that still a work in progress? Um, that that's still a work in progress. Uh, so Brian and I are collaborating on next steps around this item, um, and we should have an update in the next week or so. Cool, cool. So the we've, we've linked. So this was sort of the problem here that we were discussing yesterday. Lots of great ideas came out of the call last week. Some potential new features for the backlog. Um, so Stephen and, and Brian will be updating this issue accordingly with the outcome of that call from last week. Um, and this week, um, suggestion from Michael, EOS USA, is to discuss state database trimming. Uh, it's Thanksgiving in the U.S. now. He's unable to join today. Um, we can we can decide whether we want to continue having that conversation or table that for another day if we have folks on the line who can speak to that. Uh, but before we get into that, maybe we want to quick check in on uh, on the software development side of things for Leap Antelope. Um, last week, Leap 3.2 final release was expected. I believe that's out now. Correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and I might actually hand it over to Brian since he uh, handled the release this time. Um, but I'll fill in anything else if there is anything else to update. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, take it away, Brian. Yeah. So the uh, the Leap V2, sorry, V3.2.0 um, final uh, is, is now released on the Antelope Leap GitHub. Um, I've, I saw that some uh, block producers have already upgraded. Um, this is a it, this is not a consensus upgrade, so um, it is optional, and and uh, you know node operators can upgrade or not at their leisure. Um, yeah, and, and if you know, I'm I'm always available on uh, Telegram in the in the EOS uh, block producers channels or in the Antelope. Um, uh, uh, upgrade channels. Uh, if there are any questions about the release, so I I keep an eye on those channels. Great. So I'll, I'll drop a link to that in the updated agenda for today. Make sure everyone's got that handy. And uh, thank you, Stephen, for sharing that in the chat here. I'll pull that up. Here are the release notes. And yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll share that. Any questions from anybody or comments on the 3.2 release? Haven't actually used the Leap Util program. Um, I actually wasn't expecting it. I probably wasn't paying attention the last call when uh, when you spoke about it. Has anybody here actually used it? I have not. I like the way it, it, it says somewhere there that it's got order complete. I need to, <laughs> I need to feel that, Kevin. I, I want to feel that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Do we want to talk a little bit about Leap Util? Is there any, is there any like now we've got some node operators on the line here? This is a utility targeted to node operators. Do we want to get any feedback or testing on this? From, from some of the people on the line here? Um, I, I think it'd be helpful just to get feedback just in terms of like the experience of using it and if there's any uh, like prioritizations of commands or just organization of things that you wouldn't expect. The only thing I'd say about that is that um, we are actively making some updates here. Uh, some of it is going to be adding a few commands. I know we're working on integrating some uh, snapshot related functionality, but I also know um, there is some work related to CLI 11 that we're refactoring. I, I'm not as close to that work, but 
I, I don't want to send people too far down giving us feedback if uh, some of the nav is going to update inside of that utility. Right. So it is useful to loop node operators as a few of us on this call. Yeah, I cool. use I use kiosk all the time, right? But but, but like some of the kiosks that I'm using is from the arc. <laughs> you know, you know, like when it's just kind of there on the desktop, you're just using it all the time. <laughs> I don't even know what version I got. Cool. I guess all right. Um, just to follow on with a couple more updates. Um Beyond this, you know, uh, we, we've still got an RC out for CDT. Uh, we'll probably be looking to finalize that pretty soon. And we are still working on a few minor improvements to Dune. So we don't have a delivery date for that just yet to kind of close up this kind of three segments of our primary release process. But uh, that and system contract updates still don't have uh, an actual due date yet, but they're things that we're making progress towards. All right, so these three here are still in progress. This is out. That's correct. Cool. Uh, all right. Any other comments or questions on that? Then we can move on. Um, so the question is, do we want to talk about this? Uh, maybe something else we can talk about is the process that we want to follow as a group um to define what are the topics and is there any homework that we should be doing ahead of time you know in the case of you know the last conversation we had i think it was useful having that um that issue to discuss the net plugins as a starting point for us to frame the conversation around i don't know if we have something similar for the the topic here that Michael suggested. Um, should that be a prerequisite going forward? Do we need to, is there a process we want to define here as a group that, hey, in order to get a topic to discuss, get your problem statement written up in a way we can all review in advance and, and, and then have some process for prioritizing the order that we talk about them. I think that would definitely be helpful. I think, um, the easiest first step that would add value, I think, is just having um, a schedule where people can even like propose slots. And then we'll, of course, have a list that we can work to prioritize against. But I think even just people on the invite being able to see what's projected into the future and where they'd want to be engaged, I think, would uh, make a big difference. Okay, yeah, that's an easy fix. So I'll couple couple improvements I'm going to make sure we're linking to these agendas in the uh, in the calendar invite and we'll be add I'll add a sort of a calendar rudimentary calendar on upcoming topics and and a way to sign up for those for future open slots um, this time I just did put a put a put comment give give an opportunity to thumbs up and thumbs down and we see we had a few thumbs up as a first step tab what's tab ross you know that little button on the left next to the queue tab <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> so like you know you know well matthew's saying order complete so in oh, mind, okay. order okay. complete is tab 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 well <laughs> Yeah, that's what I tried. I tried tab. It doesn't do anything. So that's why I'm asking. How's all the complete supposed enough. to work? Oh, push it harder. Oh, oh. All right. <laughs> I believe they have to install it. Um, there are scripts that have to go in a known location. So if you don't want to install it, like I, I hate installing anything, but uh, I think you can probably copy those scripts manually. Uh, I'm not sure where the documentation for that is, but we can. Maybe find it and point it to you, point you at it. Well, that would be Switch. good because there's nothing in the instructions. You see, you see what's happened here. It's it's the little things that are the most important to us. <laughs> Absolutely, I use tab for everything. So autocomplete <laughs> is uh, awesome. But <laughs> totally. 
Yeah, we need to uh, we need to get the docs together for that and and um, and get that somewhere. Yeah, we'll take care. You guys, care are, of you guys are talking that. about leak util now, right? Yeah. Well, well Cleo specifically has the, the auto well, complete for uh, any CLI. Yeah, Cleof has the autocomplete as well. I believe that made it in this release, right? It, it did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So we got some feedback already. Yeah. The, the easy answer is I believe you have to install them. Um, if you don't install them, then we'll have to get you the manual instructions. Well, I mean, I just run a build, copy the binaries over to the machine, and yeah, that's that, what I've been doing since, you know, 2018. Fine. Right, exactly. And, and that's what, what I would do as well. But, you know, if you actually do an install, it, it puts in script somewhere that makes all that stuff work. Uh, right, which I don't because build machine and the run machine are two different machines. Yeah, yeah. So we should get the manual instructions because it's just a couple of scripts you got to throw in a directory. It's not that big a deal. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get that taken care of. It won't happen Gosh. this week, obviously, yeah, we, but within the next week. Yeah, we don't care about pairing. We don't care about any optimizer. We care about <laughs> autocomplete, damn it. We want it. We've seen it. It's advertised. <laughs> Show it to us. <laughs> All right. Back to state database trimming. Well, actually, sorry to sorry to interrupt. Before we go to that, I, I, I wanted to ask um, uh, Kevin and, and Stephen whether you think it's worthwhile here to discuss some of the optimizations that we've we've been discussing with regards to the P2P improvements. Well, I, I think we mostly discussed that last week, but if if there's more things, I, I guess we did have a meeting since then that we could bring in here. Um, yeah, I think we got we got more specific with like some of the things that we we might want to uh, do for the next release. Um, and so I, I don't know, I, I don't want to derail by any means if, if we'd rather focus on state database trimming, but as we have an update and we've sort of talked around the P2P improvements a little bit, I thought I'd at least bring it up. Well, maybe let's settle on whether we need to have time for state database trimming today. Um, so I don't, I don't have a problem statement. I'm, this is foreign to me. I'm not a node operator myself. I'm just, I'm just here organizing the meeting. Um, is there anybody who has a good grasp of this problem that could frame it up to have a conversation on this? Or again, do we need to wait uh, another day for when we have Michael on the line to, to frame that conversation for us? Problem should be well understood. It takes too much RAM to run Node US, especially on Wax. And the problem. How do we how do we reduce it? What's the techniques? What's the plan? Ideas, I yeah. guess. So maybe maybe it's mislabeled. It's not really the state. So when you say state by database to me, I'm thinking about what's saved on the hard drive. I suppose it is a replica of what's in memory, but yeah. Save RAM. I, I, I assume <laughs> that's what Michael meant, which is one of I the coalition top priorities. So um, yeah, so say that I'm, again. Uh, how would you reframe this? Well, well, so either he was talking about that it thrashes the hard drive because it's a replica of what's, of what's in RAM, or it was actually this to save some save some RAM. So or I, some combination thereof. Thereof, yeah. I, I suspect it's just because it's it's the RAM thing, saving RAM. Yeah. So the problem is we're using too much RAM, basically. Is that for? Oh, yeah. I, I think I think that's the problem. Yeah, we use we use way too much RAM, especially when uh, everything's in memory. We need it to be fast, but not in RAM. <laughs> so quickly on this topic, uh, it is correct that this is an Antelope Coalition priority. Um, I can also say that. They're actively working towards approving an RFP that's related to research uh, for some of these RAM limitations. Um, so I, I think that we could definitely gather feedback today, but I also wanted to provide some awareness that I think that there's going to be a request for people to perform research to propose 
the solutions to these specific things as an opportunity to, you know, contribute towards the coalition's goals. Um, so I think your the, the feedback would, of course, be helpful. I just wanted to provide that context that there's a set of requirements that's been drafted around doing that research specifically um, across a few different strategies. I think one question there I have just as a um, something to think about to you know from from you guys' perspective is what are you willing to trade in terms of performance for reduction in state size in memory size? Um, you know, is there a is there a percentage? Is there something that you would talk about uh, there in terms of what what any particular change would be willing to um, trade, you know, 10%, 50%, you know, what, what sort of performance would you be willing to give up for a smaller uh, state RAM size? From my perspective, there's clearly a lot of stuff that's in RAM that isn't regularly accessed. And we get around that by, you know, maybe dumping some of it inside swap or um, using the other mode. That you guys have, maybe there's a way to optimize what's actually kept in RAM. Some more smarts. Yeah, well, I mean, the or like the first step could be like a more codify the tempfs solution. So, uh, like, uh, it's kind of there. Uh, it's kind of there already with the other mode, right? Well, yeah, the, the the database direct access mode on disk. Yeah, but yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, you know, it uses all your uh, your IOPS on Incredible. your and kills your your uh, NVMe drive, right? Where tempfs, you know, there's well, I'll write a script, load this, move the files around, then oh, it works, um, which is a bit awkward to explain to somebody how to use that. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though Ross wrote a nice article on how to do that, it's um. But the you know. the tempfs strategy, um, like inside of Linux, the way that it uses the tempfs and the swap file, seems to work quite well. It'd be nice if we added another level of smarts on top of it. That, um, yeah, like you're saying, that that it, it immediately went there, not putting yeah. everything into resident uh, memory that needed to be replicated. Yeah, so I'm not sure, you know, how, how do we determine what is needed and what is not needed? Yeah. Right, because I guess the 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 as transactions arrive to a node, they get speculatively executed right away, which would then pull stuff into the cache. So by hopefully by the time you got to produce a block, uh, it's already in cache. However, if the transaction arrives while block production is in progress then I think the problem is it's going to get billed for CPU for loading the stuff off the disk or wherever it's not in active memory. Uh, maybe Kevin can correct me. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Right. So it probably needs some strategy to not count that load the stuff off disk into memory as part of the transaction cost. Otherwise, you're going to be randomly billing people for too much depending on whether it was in cash or not in cash, which is... You know, if we look at what we're trying to do in the EOS and Telos ecosystems right now, is trying to give a nice average billing to people without all these spikes, right? So uh, I don't want to introduce a feature that introduce more weird CPU cost spikes. What are you thinking, Kevin? Have you got something playing on your mind that you reckon? No, uh, no, but. I mean, somewhat implicit in that in your answer there was, I think, was that you're not willing to trade any performance for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, well I mean, that's the normal answer, right? I want all of it. Well, right. We're trading so, performance already. I mean, I mean right? the question still stands: Are you willing to give up any performance for less memory use? And if the answer is no, then I mean, you know, that certainly changes. I think what options are available. Um, well, from my perspective, we really are trading some of that in because we we we're running a 128 gig 
um, state database inside 64 megs, 64 gigs of RAM uh, using TempFS and letting that sort it out for us. And it seems to kind of work. So does that mean we don't need a solution? Just codify well, that? And, and well, through? what Matthew was saying is maybe, have, yeah, something, yeah. And, and is it doing the right thing? Is anything that's sort of duplicated? And do you have to maybe replicate everything? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. You know, from a from a fundamental low-level blockchain operational standpoint, from where I, I know that you are quite very, you understand the tacit details of it, is, you know, is any way to optimize it. We've already taken a step where, hey, stuff that isn't regularly accessed, we're putting that on disk. If we could make it, let me take it to the next level, like, okay, well, you know, we know this is definitely not going to be used much. We can immediately put that through to uh, a TempFS folder or something like that. You know, I don't know. But that's the thing is, how do you know, how do you really know it's not going to be regularly no, accessed? I, I know. One time's <laughs> AR. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? So that comes back to my comment about we need to be able to load stuff from the not recent cache without causing a CPU billing issue for a user. So I guess maybe that's the requirement. Yeah. So maybe a transaction, maybe transactions can't get in a block if they arrive while the block is being produced, for example. So the transaction has to arrive before the block production cycle. Um, and if it doesn't, well then, you know, it waits the next block. Because then it will how, be next how about week. there's always a warming cycle? It always, yeah, it's it's kept on the side until it's requested once, and then boom, then it gets kept there for a determinate amount of time. And so, not, so we're it's put out again. So we're willing to trade off one block production cycle to delay a transaction. Maybe is potentially the yeah. trade off we're talking about here. Why not? It seems like a reasonable like yeah. if you haven't accessed your account in a year and all of a sudden you do a transaction if we delay you by one block or two blocks does that yeah. really matter no nah. probably not not at all but that's also under the assumption that someone's not deliberately abusing this heuristic uh, of it's course because they could create a million accounts and then cycle through them and well I mean, since, rush. since you know, any contract can read any other contracts tables. Uh, mm. You know, it's someone can someone can basically start spamming reads across the entire database. Then you get subjectively billed for using too many accounts. Yeah, and even if you force <laughs> speculative execution, you can, you know, you can rig your transaction to execute differently when it's actually put into a block. Right. Mm. So I mean, we 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 see that already, and you can do that with what Amat is talking about with reads. Right. Nominal case, you read your own tables, and your attack uh, vector is you read other tables. Mm -hmm. Although maybe we shouldn't go into too much details on how to attack the network. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> Attacking network one hundred and one. <laughs> Watch the YouTube. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, all of these solutions are, you know, how, how does it help the normal case? And then how, do, how is somebody going to, you know, do weird stuff with it? Because we've seen interesting activity for any, you know, weird stuff over the last four years. So I suppose, I suppose the problem statement is that uh, we're using too much memory, especially with the busier chains, and it's just increasing on a day-to-day -day basis more and more and more and more until eventually, you know, I don't know about Moore's law on, on RAM, but, you know, it's getting harder and harder to effectively be, I don't know, pure everything running in RAM rather than some kind of temp first solution. Yeah, so, so a couple of things here, you know, is there an option to like make the tempfs solution more out of the box? Uh, I do remember opening a issue for block one way back when to try to do that. Uh, that's one possible option, which doesn't require a huge redesign. Maybe uh, the other thing is maybe um, what was I thinking? No, I forgot. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Am I capturing this right? Temp FS? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's T M P S. T M P F S, one word. Yeah. One acronym. <laughs> uh, yeah, I forget what I was going to say. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. This Again. And what was what was the other side of this trade off here? You were talking about where uh, maybe oh. we're willing to trade off one block production cycle for for you know loading data into RAM. So yeah, like a, what do you call it in cache? Like when you cache something, it's like a warm a warming block. I don't know what you. I don't know what the the correct yeah. way to say it, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean, Kevin. Like you know, you just request it, put it in cache, and then it's available. Put it in the RAM, and it's available. Which then comes with some issues, because it could be maybe abused. All right, so. <laughs> this is kind of a abstract and sort of ignorant thought, I think, maybe. But like, I wonder if the uh, some form of economic incentive and disincentive could apply to it to encourage mm -hmm. contract developers to be explicit about what things should be held in ram versus you mean like a disk versus ram sort of thing that you specify yeah, yeah. <laughs> two tiers of memory <laughs> well that would help well, but it, yeah, it doesn't yeah. help with the accounts <laughs> unless we're rewriting the right. account management system, right? right? Which is the big problem. Yeah. Um, the other the other thing that I, that I thought of like two minutes ago, which I've forgotten that I remember now, is I don't know, is there a way to speed up uh, like heap mode? Like when you start node with uh, in heap mode, which yeah. loads everything into RAM, it takes bloody forever. So, yeah, I mean, it that's... <laughs> Clear, that clearly can be as fast as your disk can be, and it's not today. Yeah. So I mean, that's a low hanging up, low hanging fruit optimization there. Say that again. Sorry, I was capturing heat, an, another note while you we were saying heat that. mode. Heap heat make mode? heap mode faster. Heap, heap like heap. the heap of leaves. Okay. Yeah. Make um, heap mode faster. <laughs> Because heap mode is similar to TempFS, especially if uh, you just restrict how much RAM is in the, the machine and and uh, you've got a big swap file. Well, no. Well, yeah. But it, it's it's worse than TempFS, kind of, because it loads, well, it, because it's slow. Like, it loads everything in RAM it's, and then uh, swaps yeah, okay. everything out. Okay. And then it's like, yeah. so yeah, we use that okay. a lot, but it, it's really not ideal. I mean, yeah, I mean, and TempFS isn't super lightning fast, but um, yeah, I, I, I use TempFS instead of Heap because it just, uh, it was, I like to have the memory management done from an OS level. There, yeah. there wasn't a specific, I didn't do any benchmarks against the two. Heap mode uh, needs to be faster. Yeah, I don't know if there's any other. Suggestions. Because, this is, this yeah. is a hard problem. But so I think it, the initial discussion or suggestion was state database trimming, which I think is the one thing we haven't actually talked about. Is like, but that's that's this. That's what we think that this this is what he's talking about. I don't think he's specifically talking about like trimming the state database. The state database is just what we run inside memory. I see. Okay. Yeah, you don't really need it smaller for like disk size or something, right? It's not like it's you know it's yeah. terabytes yeah. large. It, it, no, it, the the size on it. disk is not a problem, right? It's yeah. the yeah. size in RAM that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, and that right, last right. sentence that you have there, you actually mean make heat mode startup faster, not uh, yes. Yeah. Startup. Yeah. And, and I guess shut down as well. But startup is supposed to be correct. Fast. Sorry, Matt, you were going to say something? Well, I just think part of the problem here is that, you know, I think it's it's possible to imagine how in the current design, even just memory usage can be reduced. But, you know, that's really just like even like a short or a, maybe a midterm solution. Like if the idea is that you always want to be able to operate a network on the scale of, 
you know, wax or something on 64 gigs of RAM, then yeah, I start wondering if you really need some more uh, invasive changes to the protocol, like kind of what you're talking about with the, the RAM versus disk. Uh, yeah, potentially. Yeah. So maybe yeah. we need to bucket this into short term things we can do in the next six months, nine months, whatever, and something, oh, let's think about long term we're doing disk storage and what that means to contracts and you know how do you migrate from an existing system to you, that you, you see what pat just said there matt and we, we're not just trying to run wax for instance on the most leanest nodes available he's saying that we need about 256 gigs of ram to run what's actually required in the state database that's a bit surprising. Yeah. Why, why do you need 256? Well, that's just, that's just how big it is. If you had, if you didn't have any kind of, um, sorry, he said 128. So uh, last time I looked, it was over 128 gigs of RAM. So as soon as you go lower than that, you'll be doing some kind of swapping because it needed more. Like the actual state database itself is already way up there on 128 gigs of RAM or 128 gigs of data size so it's just about you know how far do you go to start trimming that off and swapping it out you know and, and it'll just keep on going and going and going as far as growing in size to maybe it'll get to a point where it's unsustainable you know really right now some of the high performant bp nodes they're using like consumer-based cpus that have got a trouble with um you, know, you you can't necessarily put that amount of RAM in a box, you know. So it's that kind of stuff. We kind of like at a, a turning point where you know we need more RAM. Some platforms can't even take that kind of RAM at this point. So it's a bit of a challenge. If there was a way for us to um, manage that amount of physical RAM usage from the actual Nodia side of things, it would be it would be awesome. Yeah, or we could just get the hardware vendors to create really fast CPU cores with supports lots of RAM. Maybe that's easier. <laughs> Dear Intel, please create us a platform like this. Yeah. You know, because the, like seriously, acquiring hardware is the is a big challenge because it needs to be, you know, very fast core with a lot of RAM. And how many use cases have this uh situation? Blockchain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, gaming, gaming, but gaming doesn't need, you know, 512 gigs of RAM. Oh, sorry. I'm talking about uh, fast CPU cores. Fast Most CPU cores are, with yeah. high amounts of RAM. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, so it's the two so things that, together. That's the problem, right? Because the gaming is where it's, it's at. So all the high performance CPUs per core are gaming, but they don't need a huge amount of RAM. That's right. So the platforms by default don't like suddenly support half a terabyte of RAM. A support right. if you're lucky 256 gig but most of the time maximum 128 gig so the only other thing that i've seen is like maybe like animators need a lot of ram uh, and high cpu speed when they're doing that so but yeah but the, this is not a normal use case for uh for vendors to create hardware for so it's been a challenge to uh to acquire such machines So yeah, I mean, if we if we want to discuss, you know, totally rearchitecting core fundamentals of how Node OS or Leap or Antelope protocol works, uh, great. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the best person <laughs> to do that. Do we want to? So I think that was a good um, good thing you've mentioned there. Is there an opportunity to bucket these short term, long term? Sounds like there's some low hanging fruit here. I heard this one maybe is a low hanging fruit we can put under short term. Did I get that right? I just had a look. Is Wax is 86 gigs in use in the state DB. Yeah, it's reduced over the last couple of weeks, months. I'm sure it been... was over 128. It was over 128. 
they, it's been reduced because they're freeing up from the, the random number generator. They're releasing RAM. I think the TempFS one would, would probably fit under short term, right? Enabling, disabling account queries also plays a role on uh, the, the overall amount of RAM consumption or not. Say that enabling and disabling account queries. Account queries? Account queries, yeah. Because Is they are loaded a... into, into RAM or not. So typically yes. on a on a on a on a producer node you will not enable account queries. On an API node you will. So the consumption on an API node is a little higher. Especially with uh, WAX where we have millions of accounts. Uh, okay. So is that is that a, a new configuration request right now? It's always no, enabled. No, no, no. It's already it's already there. It just plays a role uh, when you when you when you yeah run your own nodes, depending on if you enable or disable it. Um, the wrong consumption is, is higher or lower. Yeah, that oh, okay. was a feature request that was added in one point eight two point oh. I forget. <laughs> Uh, based on uh, discussion okay. uh, to save history queries, let's just have Node.js provide this. Yeah, and so, that's not state RAM, that's just RAM RAM. Yeah, yeah I was, I was looking at that, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's no more RAM, yeah. So it, um, would it be disabling or enabling would be the reduction, or does it depend? That's already, it, that's already it, available. It's already it's already there. It's already a feature that's already there. But right. The so, but yeah. is there a, a instruction to provide? You know, hey, node operators, disable account queries. You save on RAM. No, you have, have to enable. You have it. to enable it by default. Yeah, you have to yeah. enable okay. it by default. It's disabled. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not sure there's anything to do there on this. Right. Yeah. I actually but, never noticed it. <laughs> I've never noticed it. But yeah, it but it, it's, a, it. it's a great point. But yeah, it definitely uses more RAM on the, the API nodes. Then you know your sentence is wrong. It's disabling account queries saves RAM. And enabling just increases RAM. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. it's disabled by default. So yeah. Oh, so just leaving it disabled. Okay. Do you, do you have a feel for how much? That adds how much RAM that that adds to a node. Uh, I don't know. I don't really, don't know. I never checked. Nah. Because I wonder if that's something like for short term. Like if we just move that to disk, um, yeah, it would make it slower. But I, I wonder if you okay. care. <laughs> I would assume that if we have like a, a clever caching me mechanism for, for accounts that would work well. I mean, how many of the accounts we have on WAX are frequently accessed? It's probably just a small percentage. Um, and this small percentage is accessed again and again, right? Right. Um, so if, so if you could give us an idea of how much RAM like that's using on WAX, um, yeah, I mean, maybe a short-term solution there is to just move that to disk with a very small cache size and you know, because that doesn't affect your um, your BP performance in terms of you know like how much stuff's getting in the block. This is just an API uh, node sort of thing, so you might want to trade uh, off RAM for for performance. Yeah. So what's that? Moving the account queries to disk? Yeah. Yeah. Now. Granted, we get a feel for how big it is. Now, if it's one gig, well, then obviously that's not going to make any difference. But, you know, if it's a substantial part of the RAM on your API node is, is enabling that account query thing, which it may be. I, I just don't know what that looks like uh, on, on WAX. Uh, and, you know, like we could do that. We could evaluate how much that is. And, yeah, look at alternatives. Yeah, so it's uh, how, as well. How would I tell how much RAM is it using? You happen to have one that's got it enabled and one that doesn't. I do, but there's like different amounts of peers and stuff. Doesn't that affect it as well? It, it does, yeah. So, I mean, we might need a, a little bit more scientific. Okay. I'm looking for the 32 gig saving. I'm going to find it. 
<laughs> well, let me just have a look. I mean, we've got we've obviously got it on our public APIs, and our um, block producer doesn't have it. So let me see. Yeah, it's probably not a very good comparison because the API is no. doing a lot of stuff as well. And, uh, Okay, well, it's going to bring us back around to a relevant topic, which is just um, how we actually qualify these improvements and I think inputs on like how tangibly we can evaluate that and even like early ideas around like controls across uh, different configurations. Um, those perspectives are always valuable. Okay, how about this, Kevin? Our public AP, our public seed node is using 94.4 gigs of RAM. And the state database is 86.8 .8 gigs of RAM. The OS is probably using less than a gig. So maybe somewhere in there, there's three gigs of RAM, four gigs of RAM, maybe. It's not huge. Yeah, it doesn't sound like work it like it's worth it. But yeah, it's not like this. Oh, there's the golden ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to Stephen, could you repeat what um Oh, Sounds I was like just you're suggesting that um, input on like what the actual configuration should be to evaluate these changes would be helpful uh, from the perspective of some of these node operators, um, even just comparing those two nodes that were just mentioned. Um, you know, it, it, it would be helpful to have perspective and input there. A fun exercise for you guys in terms of like this understanding this memory stuff is you can use the new util to convert your state database to JSON. Um, I don't think that made the 3.2 release, so that may just be in the main branch, but you can do that and then, you know, you can open that JSON, that very large JSON file in an editor and you can look around You can even kind of get a feel for like how much of it is, is accounts by looking at the section that's accounts and how much of it's uh, user table data by looking at those. You can look at individual user tables actually to get a feel for how big each of those are. So kind of an interesting uh, exercise if you guys want to dig around and see like where your memory is actually being used. Now, of course, it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but certainly gives you a good kind of feel for it. What would happen if you edited anything in it? Uh, yeah, you can do that. We don't. I don't think we have the feature in in main or anywhere yet to, to read in a snapshot uh, or a, a JSON format. Uh, maybe we do. I, I, I forget where, where we have that functionality, but um, maybe that's a main right now. But yeah, you can actually do that uh, <laughs> and read in the, uh, the, the the changes. But if we had to go and change anything, would there be like a different hash on the file that it wouldn't enable it to communicate with its peer or something like that just out of interest um i'd have to go look where we landed on, on that i think we forced um the chain id id different by default but obviously you right. can, it was just out of interest yeah, because yeah, i always again, saw it as yeah i always it, saw it as something that needed to perfectly match its peer well yeah uh, for consensus to, to work, you you have you know your states have to match. Uh, now, what consensus requires and what you can do by hacking up a node are two different <laughs> things. Don't say any more. I bet Michael goes chat to the <laughs> Ross. Quick quick question: These four gigabyte by the, the the stats you 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 told us are they WAX or EOS? WAX. Okay. Wax. Okay. So Sorry, maybe, I, look, I, was, maybe they, I was looking for something big, you know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, uh, Daniel, maybe you can can add that uh, these four gigabytes are for 
roughly 14 million accounts. But I mean, I've also got like um, monitoring agents running and like, I don't know how to specifically break it out. I don't know how, I don't know how accurate this is. This is li literally thumb suck. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, just four and five gigs is a huge difference in data, right? And I, I'm just, this is just, it's not 32 gigabytes. That's not yeah, so yeah. much stuff. Just if, if someone comes back in the future reading these notes and asking for where, <laughs> where this number comes from, it's for 40 million accounts. And on, I mean, on EOS, it's much less. So it makes even... Uh, oh, it's wax. Yeah, yeah, smaller it's wax. difference, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just wax because that's just the monolith. That's the one uh, we always measure against at the moment. Okay. Well, we've, we've got less than 10 minutes left on the, uh, on the calendar here today. Sounds like we've got some starting off points at least. Any, um, any other thoughts or ideas we want to discuss while we're all here? And otherwise, if we want, we have five minutes left to maybe close the loop on that discussion Brian and Stephen, you had about the peer-to-peer -peer improvements. I don't know if there's anything within five minutes you, you wanted to share. Sure. So there were, um, I'll give kind of the the breadth rather than depth first. And, and then if there's anything we want to go deeper on, it could be a topic for next time or something. Um, so there were three, three major um sort of ideas for optimizations on the P2P side that we sort of discussed. Um, one was that we could uh, we could make lighter the the validations that occur for um, for blocks f on relay. Um, right now they're doing like a full full validation and we could just do header validations to confirm that the signatures from a trusted, source um, like the producer that should have produced that block that sort of thing and that could save um time and make that relay faster um another suggestion was that we could um sort of codify if if a block is full in terms of build uh cpu time um immediately broadcasting that and starting on the next block um so that you know you, you can kind of get ahead there um and then the last uh of those suggestions was um sort of auto configuring your your um i didn't actually take this note i, I believe it was peers auto configuring your peers to optimize latency um which i think today is something that bps are doing manually based on like the the rankings, right? Who's comes before and after them. Um, and so that could just be built in to leap as an option that you can turn on. Um, well, I think there's two different parts to that last one, right? There's optimized for the schedule, mm -hmm. who's before me, who's after me, versus optimized for who's got the lowest latency. Because right. who's before me and after me might be on the other side of the planet. Yeah, so most of that was what we talked about in the meeting last week. Um, the kind of different idea there that I, I don't think had come up at all last week in our discussion was the, the relaying block faster by doing just header validation before uh, without doing a full a block validation. So that gets, you know, that that's targeting the idea that, you know, you've got to get those last couple of blocks from the BP before you to the next BP. Uh, that mechanism would get those blocks there faster. So how is that different than the existing trust producer config option where you can say who to trust or that's the same thing? Right. Uh, it, it's not the same thing. The the trust um, uh, 
you know, turns off the, the signature validations on the, the transactions within a block. It still does the full block uh, evaluation, um, okay. except for, wait, now that you mention it, um, the trusted producer may actually go ahead and, and relay the block quicker, but this would be do it for everybody, not just for trusted producers. So the idea is that you'd still validate uh, the signature on the block and validate the 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 transaction Merkle root so that you know the, the block isn't um so you know you're doing some set of value evaluation of the of block integrity you're just not evaluating all the you're you're not actually executing all the transactions within the blocks uh, to modify your state as part of that before you relay the block so does this mean we can have nodes that don't have accurate state and just relay blocks we didn't talk about providing that sort of functionality no you would still evaluate the blocks it's just it just changes when that node passes the block on to the the next to to its peers it would still after it did that continue oh. to, to apply and evaluate those blocks it's just when it released its block to its block that block to its peers is sooner than it currently is. Right. So with, relay with that, and then validate rather than instead of validate, then relay. Basically. Correct. With, yes. With, yes. Would that have been useful though, to have some sort of service that can light validate the chain and forward blocks along? Like you were asking? Well, so last week we talked about, well, maybe we could get rid of these blocks only nodes as an option but what if we just made the blocks only nodes really fast and they didn't have any state right because if you're just going to forward blocks yeah the merkle root is good forward the block but never even just throw it away after right so you don't actually have a state database i don't know is that possible maybe that's useful now we can relay the blocks really fast they don't take a lot of ram um, but you use them as a demarcation that's what you're saying well, I'm saying like my request last week to Kevin to think about or to the team was like I have these nodes that just relay blocks so that we can get the blocks faster to their peers. Right. Yeah. And what I my suggestion was, well, could we get figure out how to make it so Node.js doesn't need those and can relay the blocks faster, which is what this suggestion is. What if we don't validate? We just pass the blocks along. Well, we could also have nodes that just pass blocks along and don't keep any state. Right, then they're really cheap to run. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because they yeah. don't need any memory. Yeah. yeah. Right? Just yeah. relay blocks. Yeah. yeah. Right. And right. maybe those nodes also deal with like loading, you know, snapshots, for example, when we get to doing snapshots and pushing snapshots through the peer-to-peer -peer network. Right. You can't get transactions here, but you can get blocks and and uh, snapshots. It's like a it's like a provider uh, node, like a like a P yeah, node in PLS. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Cool. Another feature for the backlog, perhaps? Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, for 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 people who are for smarter than me to talk about them. Yeah. <laughs> if it makes any sense. <laughs> like spin up a nodius lot that only pushes blocks. Hmm. Cool. Well, we're at time. Uh for next week. Anything here we want to carry on, or again, we have this suggestion from Matthew to talk about what statistics are being added to the Prometheus Explorer in 4.0. Um, is that is that I see some heads nodding. Sounds like maybe that's a good topic for next week. Is that a good framing of the conversation or is there some way to reframe? Is there a problem statement here we want to kind of put out there for people to start thinking about between now and next week? Well, I think from our perspective, is we'd love to hear what those are. Uh, if we're going to discuss them, so you know, bring them to the next meeting. Like, bring your list of what you'd like to have in Prometheus to to so that we can gather those requirements. I mean, that's kind of what we're looking for at this stage. Is like, what do you want? And then you know, maybe we can start prioritizing those, or you know, get low hanging fruit first, or you know, look at various ways of providing those. Yeah. So the the problem statement is. Node.js is a black box. We have no idea what it's doing. Let's provide some statistics about what's going on 
and what is the right priority of what things are going to be added? That's yeah. what, what, what do you want to see? What do you want to see? What's doable? And then figure out the intersection between those. I, I have a long list, but they're not all I'm sure. probably yeah. <laughs> reasonably doable in a short time frame. So I, I'm, I, I know my, my list won't uh, get full, fully done. Cool. But let's start with something easy. You know, uh, go for Piers. it. Cool. Sounds like a good hot topic. Sounds like we've got uh, people in agreement here. No alternatives being raised. So that's we'll uh, pencil that in for next week. Uh, unless there's anything else, we can wrap things up. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.